Welcome to the second half of Episode 7 in our series of videos on antennas and propagation. Here, we'll continue our discussion of the reflection of radio waves. If you haven't watched the first half yet, no worries. Uh, you can look at these in any order. In the first one, we talked about applications of reflection to both propagation of signals, such as in our graphic here, uh, and also to antenna design, where we may use reflecting surfaces to direct signals in a particular direction. In this part two video, we're going to go into just a little bit of theoretical background. And that's important to understand the full gamut of things that radio waves can experience, such as refraction, diffraction, and absorption. And all of those things are represented in our little campy graphic here, where we have some cell tower antennas at the top of a tower, and we have a direct path, but then the signal gets obstructed and has to go through the walls of a building to get to this user over here with a cell phone. Or, in the case of this user, there's a tree in the way, which is generally representative of a lot of trees or something significant. That user also experiences a decrease in signal level. However, they also experience multipath from reflection off the ground and reflection off buildings and so forth. And finally, our poor person over here trying to receive a signal um, using diffraction from the top of a mountain, probably not going to get it. So to understand how signals propagate in a real-world environment from an antenna to users, we need to at least understand the magnitude of the effects on the signals. And we're going to do that in the second half of today's video. Look at signals transmitting through various materials in buildings, for example, such as drywall in a house, or windows in a house, or in a commercial building. So those demonstrations are how we're going to quantify the effects. We're not going to present lots of equations, so don't let the theory bother you here. Let's get started. If you were to take an undergraduate course on electromagnetics, you may encounter diagrams such as these in a textbook. And they would in general go into a lot more depth than we're going to go into here. Here, I just want to say a few words about the main effects. So, I'll begin by explaining what all this means. This dark brownish colored region is a side view of wood, say plywood or particle board or something. Or it could be drywall. The white arrows represent ray tracing diagrams of electromagnetic signals, in this case impinging on the left side of this wood. And the E sub 1 superscript plus here means that this is the electric field strength hitting this wood as it goes in the positive direction, which is to the right. When it gets to the wood, it experiences a change in permittivity and permeability, perhaps, but mainly permittivity. From what I've labeled epsilon naught mu naught here, this is for free space or air. But in the material itself, there is a different permittivity. And there may be some conductivity as well, sigma. So when the electromagnetic wave hits that boundary between air and the wood, some of it gets reflected. But that reflected signal is going to be less than the incident signal E1+. plus. The rest goes into or transmits into the board. And then that signal, E2+, plus may bounce off of the second boundary where we go back to air. And we'll actually do a demo of this with a door in my house. So the signal that emerges on the right-hand side is E3+, plus, and notice that it's shorter arrow. I'm trying to indicate that it's weaker than the E1+, plus here. Just a qualitative indication. And that's because some of the signal was bounced back here as E2-, minus and also because there is some absorption in the material. Now, other demonstrations we're going to look at involve the signal hitting a conductor. So we'll use a mirror, but I'm also going to use a metal door, an exterior door in my house. In that case, the reflected signal from the boundary between air and the metal is 
virtually the same in magnitude as the signal that hit it. And we'll see why that is in a few minutes. For reasons that are gone into in detail in electromagnetics textbooks, the signal does not penetrate very far in. In fact, a few millionths of a meter. Inside the metal, the transmitted wave is essentially zero. So it's fully reflected. So how or why is, does that happen? First off, as the electromagnetic field encounters the metal, it sets up currents on the surface of that metal. And as we've talked about in previous videos, those currents will generate radio waves, and those radio waves will send the signal in this direction, also in this direction, but it's going to lie on top of the one that was potentially going to enter, and it's going to actually cancel it in this region. So all of it is reflected. So to illustrate what I just tried to say there, let's look at the right-hand diagram. Here I've got the ray tracing arrow, shown big, so you can see that this is the incident or incoming wave encountering the metal surface. But I'm also showing electric field strengths. And like in our previous videos, this is a snapshot in time. So at this particular time, the field is zero here at the boundary, and it peaks a quarter of a wavelength back, and then it goes to zero and so forth. Now, this picture is moving to the right. So stay with me here. It's a little tricky to understand. So this entire field pattern as shown here will shift to the right. Um, as it does so, it will reflect off the surface and come back to the left. So here's our reflected E-field wave coming back. And it's moving to the left. Now, if you think carefully about this, you may realize that if this metal surface had not been here, then the incident wave would have continued on as shown in the sort of faded diagram here inside the metal. But the currents that are set up in the surface of this metal must, according to Maxwell's equations, satisfy this requirement at the top of our slide. The tangential E field, say this vertical field right here, must be zero at all times at the surface of the metal. Why is that? Well, that's because the conductivity of the metal is extremely high. Sigma 2 inside this metal is approximately infinity, or it's a big number. So if the tangential E field here at the surface of the metal was not zero, we would have a nearly infinite current. And we can't have that, because that's more power than we launched at the surface. So we use this boundary condition to reason through what happens. So let me try to talk us through that. Remember that these lines here, these arrows, represent the electric field at a particular point in time. This is the field distribution. Had this wave that's coming in toward the metal not encountered the metal, had the metal not been there, then the wave would have continued as shown in the shaded region here. But one quarter cycle ago, this whole picture would have been slid to the left by one quarter period. And what was encountering the metal surface at that point would have been these down arrows right here. But because one quarter cycle ago they did hit a metal surface, and because the tangential E field at that surface has to be zero at all time, the currents that were induced must set up a positive E field. So this arrow right here now has a positive E field going up, and that's what's returned and propagated to the left. So we take this entire shaded region here and flip it vertically. And then, since we know the field didn't actually go into here, it had to have been going to the left, we have to flip it horizontally as well, as it says up here. And when you do those two rotations, that's how you get this field pattern moving to the left. But here's the key take home from that. Without the vertical flip, the reflected field pattern would have been negative initially, coming back this way. But with the flip, it's positive. So we change sign, and that means that we get a 180 degree phase change when the reflection occurs. And that's the important thing to remember. Also, as we're going to see in a second, the total field in this region near the metal is double what the incident field was. So let's take a look at that. So on the left here is a repeat of what we just saw. 
the incoming ray and field pattern creates a reflected version here as shown, going to the left. But an observer at any given point along this line, say right here, this distance from the surface of the metal, just sees the total field. So they're going to see this field strength plus this field strength. So it's going to double. And that's what I'm trying to show on the right hand side. These arrows are twice as long as these arrows. So if we were to hold a receiver in this location, with and without the metal being there, without it we would see a signal strength of this much, but with the metal there we'll see double the signal strength at this location. At the surface of the metal, of course, we should see zero for reasons we've mentioned. And it turns out that at integer multiples of a half wavelength away, so at this location and this location, we will see zero. Now, it's obvious here because of the snapshot in time. But if you examine this phenomenon at different phases of the signal hitting the metal, you'll find out that you always get zero field here, here, and here. Or, not zero, small in reality, at n times lambda over 2 distance away from the surface, for all time. So, a person standing at this location will detect a strong signal. A person standing here will detect no signal at all. And then a strong signal here. Here it's shown as negative, but we, we know that it's going negative and then positive and negative and positive. The point is they're going to see a strong signal strength here. And then zero signal strength here at all times. And then a strong signal strength here. And some of you may have already recognized this as what we call standing waves. All right, enough of this theory and background. Let's get on to the fun stuff. It turns out that before radio was called radio or wireless, Hertz had to demonstrate that there were such things as radio waves. And it was theorized that radio waves were essentially light at a different frequency. And so Hertz set up an experiment to show that. And it was based on this concept of standing waves. Here's a replica of the apparatus used. This is the transmitter. And the receiver was this loop with a very microscopic gap in it that when there was a strong enough signal, there would be a tiny spark that could be seen when the room was dark. And Hertz and or assistants took that loop and moved it at different locations from the transmitter, or more specifically, at different locations from a reflecting wall. So I did a quick search on YouTube and found this really nice illustration of that going on. Here's the transmitter. And the reflecting wall here, I don't know if it was a mirror in reality, but uh, at least metal over here. And this represents the standing wave pattern. A null at the surface of the metal, a null a half wavelength away, a peak a quarter wavelength away, and then a null, and so forth. And if this pattern of null, peak, null, peak, null, peak for a standing wave was encountered when the experiment was done, when this receiver was moved along this line here, then there was good evidence that the radio waves were actually happening. And remember, nobody knew anything about radio then. This was the first radio. If you want to dive into that in more detail, I've put the link to this photo here. It's sparkmuseum.com. And on the right, the YouTube video I was looking at is from an author called Kathy Loves Physics and History channel. And you could search for that, or you could search for how Heinrich Hertz discovered radio to validate Maxwell's equations. But I want to try this myself. So here's our setup to test Hertz's experiment in my bathroom at home. I have an antenna which is hooked up to a tiny spectrum analyzer in output mode at 915 megahertz, which is an unlicensed band in the United States, so I can transmit. And I have this antenna separated from the mirror behind it. In fact, you can see the reflection of that antenna in the mirror. I also have a second antenna, which is hooked up to a tiny spectrum analyzer 
that is shown in the inset so you can see the signal levels. And I'm going to place this second antenna against the mirror and we expect a null and then I'll bring it out. What do we expect? A peak and then another null and then another peak and so forth. So I'm just going to do that real quick. So we have a null now and I'll bring it out to the first peak should be a quarter wavelength and then the next null will be a half wavelength out. And then it kind of settles out at the peak because I'm, I'm very close here. Okay, let's repeat this experiment, but I'm going to use my front door, which is, I guess, a fire door and is made out of metal. So here is the signal measuring spectrum analyzer. I will put the antenna against the door. And you can see it went down very much. And I'll bring it out, get a peak, and then a null, and then another peak. Starting to try to get another null. That's about as far as I can get because the antenna is actually above the camera here. So those demos worked pretty well. The metal exterior door in my house reflected signal just as much as a mirror did. And that's because it's metal in both cases. Now, as we know from our discussion, the incident signal E1 that hit the metal is not transmitted into the metal and there's actually going to be nothing coming out the other side. So a metal sheet, like a door, will block signals. And let's try that. Then we'll also look at the case of wood. Here's the signal level with a direct path to it. And if I move it behind the door, the signal goes away. Now let's try the same thing on an interior door made out of wood. Up against the door, bringing out, not getting any peaks or nulls. It will eventually get higher because we're getting closer to the other antenna. Let's do a transmission measurement through the door. Here's the antenna in front of the door. And I'm going to move it out and then put it behind the door. So it went down a little bit, but not much. About 4 dB. So, as we expected, the wood interior door did not significantly reflect. We saw a tiny bit in the video there if you were looking closely. And importantly, it also allowed much of the signal to go through the door. It only decreased it by about 4 dB from having the antenna on the other side. What about the drywall in a house? Radio signals are going to get into the house any way they can. So let's take a look at the drywall. To save time here, I've simply taken a couple of shots with the antennas seeing each other directly. And then there's a small piece of wall that comes out here. It's a little hard to see, but I took the antenna and slid it back here. And then this antenna is on this side of the drywall and it dropped about 4 dB also. So your Wi-Fi signal in your house, for example, is not going to experience a great deal of attenuation through the walls or the interior doors, most likely. Most of the materials, at least in my house, are reasonably transparent. But windows may not be, surprisingly. Even though they're transparent to light or semi-transparent, they actually can block radio waves depending on how they're made. When we replaced the windows in our house a few years back, we actually went for some of the uh, pretty nice ones that have triple pane glass. But the glass itself is metalized in some sense. And I took the setup that I've showed you in those previous videos and opened these windows and put it on either side and it blocked the signal. And when I put it in front of the window, I could get pretty much full reflection, just like these things are made out of metal. And this is not the first or only time that I've noticed that windows block radio signals. I'd seen it before, surprisingly, in a Radio Shack store where I was looking at a weather receiver and it wasn't working inside. And the guy says, oh yeah, just take it outside and it'll work fine. And sure enough, I did. Now, in our university, uh, we have this new building that we moved into recently. And the architecture is meant to let lots of light in. So there are windows everywhere. 
and then of course some metal support structures. And I was kind of worried about how much radio signal could get into these buildings. So we worked with the contractor and got a sample of the type of glass they were going to use. It's a very big and heavy version of the triple pane that I just showed you. And we measured its transmission in the lab. Here you can see me holding the glass, which is about a foot by a foot in size, very thick. And my colleague is holding a broadband antenna here, and there's another broadband antenna on the other side. This is a small anechoic chamber that we built so that we knew that the signal was not getting in any way to the other antenna other than through the glass. And what we found was it attenuated by 20 to 30 dB, depending on frequency. On the right-hand side is a network analyzer sweeping from 40 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. Now, ignore anything below about 800 megahertz because these antennas don't work there. But above 800 megahertz, which is about here and on to the right, this is valid data. And it says that, let's see, this is 0 dB, so 1, 2, 3, 4 divisions down. Most of the signal is below minus 20 dB on the other side of the glass. And this is relative to calibrating without the glass there. That would be the 0 dB case. And this attenuation is caused by the signal basically bouncing off instead of going through. And it's relatively broadband and probably goes out much farther than this, probably throughout the radio band. You may notice some peaks and nulls here. I think this is due to resonance uh, based on the dimensions of the glass. But the main point is uh, we get about 20, 30 or more dB of attenuation going into this building. Signals are going to get highly attenuated going through the glass and they're not going to get through the metal support columns either. So this is pretty much a shielded enclosure. And sure enough, when we uh, moved into the building, we found that the signal strength inside was very weak. So how can we use what we've learned here today? Well, first off, we recognize that the signal can be blocked from getting into a structure by basically reflecting off of it. And whether or not that happens depends on what kind of materials we're talking about. And we've sampled a few of those today. In commercial buildings such as this one, uh, we may have issues. But in a residential building such as my house here, I don't have any issues at all. And that's because there's sort of a particle board uh, outer sheet here, and then there's drywall and so forth inside, and wooden doors, and the signals go through. They, they get a few dB of attenuation through each wall, but that's okay. Signals are generally strong enough that the link budget can support that. And that is not the case in this building over here. Uh, I actually took an FM radio into this building and measured how many stations I could get, and I could get exactly two. And in our area outside the building, when I was down here on the grass, I could get all 24 that are generally receivable in our city. What about when you're in a car? Well, most cars are constructed of metal, except for the glass. And the glass is often tinted. So um, I took the setup that I was showing you out to my garage and tested some windows. This is a Corvette that I've got in 1992. And I tested the windows because they were heavily tinted. And it turns out uh, they transmitted signals through pretty well. So not all energy efficient glass is a problem. As a little side note, <clears throat> I installed a new radio in this car and it has a GPS with it. And they tell you to stick the GPS antenna where it has a clear view of the sky. And so you need to think about that. And I was going to put it up here on the dashboard or maybe inside this glove box. But then I realized that uh, this Corvette's made out of fiberglass. So it can see through the roof, which is not true of most normal cars. Now, in our next video in this series, we're going to get back to antennas and their design. And so we'll talk about what's going on with this antenna, for example, and this antenna and others. And I hope we've laid the groundwork for understanding the types of antennas that use reflectors. Remember that you generally want the reflector a quarter wavelength away from the element itself. Except in the case of something like a dish antenna here, where as we'll learn, the signal is bounced off the dish and focused. 
So we're just using the dish in that case as a bouncing mechanism. But I would encourage you between now and then to think about what we've seen here today. In a terrestrial environment, you have objects, whether they're people or ground or light poles or glass in a building structure or concrete, etc. And as we talked about in part one of this video, those objects will cause scattering to take place. They can also, as we've seen today, block the signal, but through something called diffraction, that signal can eventually get past that blockage. And I'll leave you to research diffraction on your own. But next time you're outside or inside your house, just right now, look around and think about the materials around you and think about the radio waves and which materials they're going to go through and also the size and geometry of those. So we discussed in part one what the wavelength is and how the object size relative to the wavelength matters. So try to visualize some of this. It's kind of fun to do. So that's it for this video. As always, I hope it's helpful to you. Uh, leave some comments below if you have any. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye.